Well, happy Friday, everybody. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two decades of experience as a craftsman and an entrepreneur to answer any of your questions. And we are not going to waste any time today because this is the live estimate. I'm going to do an estimate for a real life client in real time, show you guys my process, show you how we conduct ourselves in the house. Uh, we are also going to print out a, uh, an estimate on the spot for the client, walk it back into the house, and show them a, a sample uh, if they want to see one, and uh, see if they have any questions. So uh, basically, we are in the, uh, oh, also, thank you to the PCA, the Paint Contractors Association, uh, for sponsoring this. Uh, because this is the live estimate, uh, we are foregoing the contractor question of the week, but Chris Shank will be on next week, and we'll discuss that. Uh, this is a update of uh, three years ago. Three years ago, I did the same thing. You can still look at uh, YouTube for it. It's Ask a Painter number eight. We are now on 171. Three years ago, I did an estimate live. We did a color consult. It's back when I was using paper duplicate forms. Process was a little bit different. Uh, the coding science is basically the same, give or take, but uh, I figured it was time to update this. So we are in the mobile command unit. We have mobile printer. I have my tablet. I have digital pen ready to go. We're gonna walk up there and ring the doorbell and see what happens. And also, the lovely Toots is with me today filming. So Toots, you can swing that around if you want. That's okay, <laughs> hi everyone. All right, let's do this. <laughs> So, you mentioned cabinets, and there was one other thing. So, our deck up here, our little um, landing as you come in, and then our countertops too in the kitchen. Perfect. So, kind of a few things. Let's go look at the cabinets okay. first. Okay, perfect. So, kind of right this way. Okay. So, we've got a lot of wood tones going on in here, and okay. I was kind of thinking, could we do something maybe to paint? Oh yeah, definitely. Top and bottom, same color or two different, and then okay. um, countertops, a different kind of stain, but not sealed the right way for water. Oh sure, yeah, these are beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. Solid oak must be reclaimed wood. Yes, yes, it is. It's just it's not being protective, so it's not wipeable. Oh. It's. Have you done anything to them in the past? No. Have you, have you treated them so they're just bare wood right now? Well, and when we bought the house two years ago, I'm not sure what they did prior. But we just, we oiled them periodically, oh, okay. so you can kind of see that I did that, but it doesn't seem to really give water protection, so uh, sure. with so, the sink area, it's always wet, so. Makes sense. We have the uh, same thing, actually. We yeah. have the oak countertops in our, in our house, and there's always a choice between a film-forming finish and a penetrating finish. Okay. And when you buy butcher block oil, and it looks like they probably use yeah. something similar, um, it's a penetrating oil, and it, uh, it doesn't uh, chip or come off but it also doesn't protect for that long. It almost right. has to be reapplied like sunscreen over and over. That's exactly <laughs> what we do, but not frequent enough. So it definitely, uh, I think, yeah. needs something different there. Okay, perfect. So what we did in uh, in our house was uh, we went for a film forming finish, one of the hardest polyurethanes we okay. could get. And yeah. it will show a scratch, but also it'll preserve the lightness nice. of the wood and stuff. So I'll, I'll give you an estimate for that. Okay, and it, is that like a nice glossy finish too? It is, and we can yeah. moderate the gloss depending okay. on what you want. Um, I actually like the gloss. Oh, perfect. It feels just clean to me. And, and gloss is much easier to clean, especially with an open poured wood okay. too, so. Okay. Do you have to sand down the existing finish to do something like that? Or yeah. dry it out for a period of time? or? So the, the standard process I would do, because it's been uh, a penetrating oil has been applied previously, I would make sure that we can get good adhesion. Okay. So what we would do is probably um, scrub them okay. um, with a uh, with a denatured alcohol just to make sure there's no residue on it and just from normal living. We would give it a sand and then okay. we would see what we're left with. Okay. Normally that penetrating oil doesn't go that deep, so really we can we can get rid of most of the film there. I would probably do a sample. I would pick a, a corner okay. or something, do some. 
let it dry overnight and come back and do a scratch test. Okay. Because sometimes that penetrating oil is a slow drying oil. Yeah. And if it stays wet or if it stays, you know, uh, oily, uh, it can prevent that. But it, it's not been an issue. And I've done butcher block countertops okay. and things like that. And as long as we clean them off well, they we get good adhesion. So, That's great. Yeah. I definitely want to keep them. I just, they need to yeah. be more li beautiful. livable yeah. with having kids and constant messes being wiped up. So. And, uh, and, and at least my experience with our house is that uh, with what we use, very easy to reapply later. So it's oh, not this, okay. it's not a furniture quality finish that you gotta have me to do again. Right. We can restore them, we can get it on there, and then maybe once or twice, uh, once a year, or maybe once every two years, you can reapply yourself and it's, oh, it's super easy to nice. do. So. Okay, I like that, that would yeah. be great. Sounds good. So, cabinets, yeah. um, what does is, what is your gut tell you about <laughs> color? Are, are we thinking, you know? So, uh, I like kind of the vintage look. So I know a friend of mine posted an Instagram photo and she had an olive color. Yeah. yeah. And I think she just did the base olive and then white on the top. I don't know your thoughts or even what my thoughts are on two tone like that, mm -hmm. but I definitely thought olive was kind of yep. cool. Yep. Um, white worries me a little bit with having kids. Like yep. how cleanable, how wipeable is that surface? And will you know the paint stay on nicely when I wash it every day? Yeah. Um, but what are your thoughts? So generally, um, my experience with doing a bunch of these is that if you do your cabinets white, and by white, just any form of off-white or something, you're going to add a lot of light utility here. Okay. So the kitchen will become beautiful, bright, light. But I echo your concerns about this. We yeah. have white cabinets in our house, too, and the kids actively try to tear them apart. Yeah, so, of course. Yep. Yeah, so there is that. Now, but it does add a lot of light utility. If okay. you were to do a two-tone of the uh, white or off-white on top, darker color on the bottom, that will hide a lot of wear okay. and tear, but it will also give you the light and bright up top. Right. Too. And then think, could you help me weigh in on this too? So right yeah, now we have yeah. a dark color. Mm -hmm. w would you suggest something different? Because I mean, we have the white bead board. Yep. We have a lot going on in here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. There's a lot to, a lot to fix. But um, so we have dark right now. Could that dark work with a two-tone white olive green cabinet? Or would you think that also should be addressed at the same time? My experience has been that um, if you, the olive would definitely be an accent type of color. Okay. The color on your walls, the kind of auburn, is technically an accent as well, okay. and you may get competing accents. Okay. So it's not bad, but when I think back through all my data points, most people are most happy most of the time when there is one dominant yeah. accent. Right. And, and and the proportions matter a little bit too. So it might have to be lightened up then? It, you know, if, if if you really want to bring in, if you really want to kind of open up the space and make it feel light and airy, the walls will give you almost as big of an effect as okay. the cabinets too. So And I like I like our backsplash, it's kind of you know old fashioned, but I like the dark yeah. in there. Yep. And then I would worry about going too white everywhere too. Yep. And if they're not quite the same white, you know, so that's my other thought, but Definitely, I'm open to painting the Yeah, ground. and this is a very rich color, so it's uh, it really depends on what you do with the cabinets. Okay. So if you if you paint the cabinets, you're getting rid of a color and a texture. Right. And then all of a sudden, things like the countertop all of a sudden have this punch. Yes. You know, and it's, it's, especially if you were to do all off white, magically the backsplash and the countertops are now the thing in the room. Okay. Um, another way I see people use color too, if if you're trying to put all these puzzle pieces together and something doesn't quite seem right. Um, you could also uh, do the island in an accent too. Oh, okay. I know some people like that because it's own little piece of furniture. Yeah. So if something about the two tone here doesn't make sense, or two tone with the wall paint, interjecting it onto the island too is sometimes a, okay. a useful thing. So always okay. an option. So good to know. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. And do you want any of the beadboard, the trim? Uh, we have some fur doors and stuff too. Do you want any of that included? I think I like the beadboard staying white, mm -hmm. and then because it's an old house, 1920s, you probably know this too, we have mismatched woodwork throughout oh, sure. the house, yeah. <laughs> but I don't mind it. It's yep. the quirkiness of an old house. So I think I'm okay with those staying as they are. My biggest issues are just this kind of yellow in your face uh, cabinet. Yep. Yep. Just, and I mean, then I have a question for you. Oh, absolutely. Yep. So yep. if we are looking at trim of a window here cabinet they're very similar yep. if this goes to something different is this going to just stand out now so and you, should this be white or you, you have a perfect example of the orphan window which okay. is almost every kitchen has this window that's put right in the middle of all the cabinets and it really depends on how much of the other woodwork you have around okay. i would say half of the people that have a their kitchen do that too because if you don't yeah. do it it really sticks out right 
half the people don't do it because there's so much other existing <laughs> trim that it actually helps key it in a little bit. Okay. But in your case, I mean. It's almost there. Like it is yeah. the lone window. It's really a exactly. separate color from everything else, isn't it? I think you can make a very good argument for painting, for painting it. Yeah. I think so too. Either way, I'll add it in as an yeah. option in Perfect. case the design Yeah, that'd be great. Can I ask a question on the paint for the oh, cabinet? Oh, absolutely. So when you, the type of paint you would choose, so obviously it's wipeable. Yep. What does the finish look like on that? Then is it like a semi-gloss or? So the biggest difference between what we do, if you call 10 painters, eight or nine of them would probably come in with a lacquer product okay. uh, or a water-based product. Okay. And those are fine. Uh, they, they're not very durable. Uh, they're not very washable. We use a true enamel. Okay. So this is a, uh, it, I'll actually bring in a sample cabinet door for you okay. with the actual finish, but I use a satin. Okay. And I, you know, you want something with enough shine so you can wipe it, but you also don't want. I'm not a big fan of semi gloss or gloss yeah. because they, they're not really any more washable. They're just shiny. Okay. You know, yeah. and, and most people that. like a moderate. Yes. It's it's what you would expect, and I'll show you in that. But okay. Yeah, it's it is a true enamel. It it takes longer to dry. But the benefit is it's it's an actual true enamel where you can scrub it, you can wash it, awesome. and, and you're also able to touch it up. Perfect. So unlike a lacquer finish, you'd have to get uh, spray equipment in again oh. to do it. So Yeah, that's um, not good. Yeah, and okay. lacquer is very it doesn't play well with water at all. So when we when we come into kitchens, normally, you know, you look underneath the uh, the kitchen cabinets and that's where all the damage is from water and oh. a real enamel will not have that same type of damage there but a lacquer the water goes right through it and, and peels it off interesting so, yeah well i think a satin would look nice um another question on the process of yeah. painting S start to finish how long does a kitchen like this take and how long are we you know out of commission and using a kitchen when you have kids hungry kids ah uh, yes yeah. so this is this is another one of those big differences too where okay we're going to take your kitchen for between four and five days. Okay. Uh, typically, we're done in your house at four days, okay. and we'll come back and install on day five. Okay. But all of our processes are tailored to not interrupt your family. Okay. So we're going to seal off the area, mm -hmm. and we do what's called surgical sweeting, where we'll we'll tent off the area. We use zip poles, plastic, zipper doors, so you okay. guys can come in. We'll completely seal the floor up okay. with a rubberized roofing membrane to keep Perfect. it safe. Um, if the island's being painted, uh, we will prep it in, in a certain way to preserve the uh, countertop. Okay. If not, we'll seal it off. Same thing with countertops here, appliances. Uh, everything that's not going to be painted will be completely sealed off okay. so dust and odor doesn't get into it. Perfect. Uh, the, the big difference, though, is that when we prep refrigerators, we'll, we'll take plastic from the back, okay. we'll pull it forward, and we'll do what's called envelope folding, okay. envelope packaging. So. There'll be two flaps, and then every day when we're done working at four or five, you can come in, pull the two flaps okay. back, make dinner for your family. Okay. The kitchen's fully usable. So, Perfect. I mean, you have a young family like yeah. us too, and if, if I told Toots, you can't have a kitchen for five days, it would cause some disruption yeah, in the house. Yeah, it could be you know? a problem. So, yeah. Absolutely, yep. And it's you said that house. process of sealing off the kitchen helps with odor in the house yeah. too from the paint, which is really great too, yes. because that's a concern, obviously, with little kids and being a pregnant mom. Yes. Just keeping that out of the other living spaces. Huge concern. Okay. I, I did the same process in our house, yep. and there's only, well, I, mean, I see some vents and stuff too. Yep. We actually put filters in all the vents too to keep everything okay. out of the rest of the house. Perfect. Uh, another thing we do too is we make our own air exchangers, air scrubbers, and negative air machines. So it's a, it's a big, powerful fan unit with okay. a series of filters in it that we actually put in the room. And when the, when the unit's here, it has a hose that goes out of the window or a patio door, okay. and we, we open up the zipper doorways into the room a little bit to let fresh air in, and the uh, negative air machine is so powerful, it creates a vacuum where it'll suck clean air in from the rest of your house, nice. bring it through the job site, filter the air, and shoot it right outside, so stuff doesn't right. even have a chance to migrate. That's good for your house. workers, too, I can it's imagine. It's <laughs> huge, and, and you know, number one, safety of you guys, mm -hmm. especially pregnant. Uh, rest of the family, uh, and it, it does wonders for the finish. I mean, imagine there's no particles floating right. out in the air. It's a wonderful thing. So. That's fair. Yeah. Okay, I just thought of something in the two-tone cabinet color. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Okay, when you, this was the part I stumbled over. When you get to this piece where, <laughs> what what does it become? Is it the top color? Is it the bottom color? You know, so if we're doing white up here and exactly. olive down here, 
What is this? This is <laughs> this is an easy one. Normally it's like I can give you two data points yeah. and you have to choose. That's easy. Top cover. That's so, top. So it just continues yep. there. There's no bottom. There's a so. beautiful clean break on this lower right here. Okay. Uh, that comes right to here, and that's that's the perfect example of start and stop. This okay. is a thing on its own. So perfect. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad you had an answer for that because yeah, I kind of stumbled over that personally. Yeah, so what I will do is, uh, we talked mostly about the process, but uh, after I get your estimate, yeah. I'll walk you through step by step and Perfect. fill in any gaps about okay. the little particulars about what we do here and stuff. Sounds great. Uh, do you have any other questions about this particular room? I think that's everything for the kitchen. Okay. Um, do you want to take a look at the front stoop or the deck as yes, well? Yes, let's do it. I tell okay. you what, uh, give me, I'm going to break the fourth wall and talk to the camera yeah, for a little perfect. bit. Yeah, so. perfect. Sounds great. <laughs> All right, so at this time, normally what I would do is, you know, have the client go out and I would meet them out there, but uh, I would use my phone and I would take images here to, to reference everything. And we build a folder on uh, Google Drive for this project with all the images uploaded. Uh, the reason we document these projects heavily with uh, digital images is that you know, the, sometimes uh, in, in the months between estimating and doing the projects, maybe they've built a new island, maybe they've replaced a window, maybe they've done some construction, maybe they want to add something, take it away. We have all the reference images so we can update their estimate from my office instead of having to come back out for a site visit. So at this time I'd be taking pictures and then when we get back out to the van, normally what I do is fire up Google Drive and just upload all my images instantly to reference them in case I miss something out in the van. So. Um, also, uh, any of you guys have any questions, comments, whatever else, uh, we will get to those towards the end of the show here. We're going to finish the estimate with Kendra. I'll print an estimate out on site, come back in, and then we will go through every question you guys have. So, see you outside. spindles, risers, and then the stain floor. Similar color scheme, you want to change it up? What are your thoughts? So I think similar because we have this look in a couple other spots outside as well, but um, definitely looking for some weatherproofing finishes on the top. It looks really worn right now. Yep. I think darkening that stain a little bit would be good. Um, and then if you have any suggestion on adding in a color, just to make the front door pop. So keyboard goes on the tablet. We got Jetpack here to give me some mobile internet. And my normal process uh, for taking notes, I use Microsoft OneNote because it's free and it came with the computer and it's very robust. Uh, I do a split screen. So we get my Google Drive open. We get OneNote up. And basically what I can do is have all my notes on one side and then have my estimate on one side so I can reference back and forth instead of splitting screens. Now, in my Google Drive, I'll expand this for you guys. This is the hub right here. This is how I run my business. This is the command center here. All my folders, these are very important folders to me and also estimates that I'm working on as well. And then I have all my frequently used sort of items, sheets. Uh, I have a, um, a piece of marketing about me and the company and what we do. We have our RRP, uh, the EPA lead law thing, exterior estimate, interior estimate, an invoice, new construction and remodel invoice, a what to expect sheet, which I'll go over later, 
I have the dashboard, which uh, shows me all the numbers in the business, uh, the queue. And then I have a bunch of other little uh, internal reference sheets there. But up top, you can see that we have a folder for this particular job. And I like to separate out interior and exterior estimates because normally people do them at separate times. So I have two separate estimates here, exterior and interior. And the exterior is gonna be a little bit easier. So I will open that one up first. Take just a second to load. Okay, so let's see if we can make it a little. There we go. So now I have my estimate form, and this is just a Google Sheet that I made. Uh, again, uh, Google uh, Drive is amazing. It's free, basically, and it's it's so robust that uh, you know we've done uh, business with up to 22 people running it, and we've not reached the limits of what Google Drive can do with a little manual entry. So. Uh, when I pull up to the house, uh, in my office, I've already filled out all the estimate sheets. So I'm not putting in name, address, phone number. When I get here, I want to be on the spot. And normally I give myself five to 10 minutes in the van to get this estimate uh, filled out, uh, printed out, and then walk back in. I don't want to keep them, keep them waiting. So estimate here, notes here, and we're going to go through the exterior. So we have the stoop. And uh, we're gonna give her an item for uh, the stained portions and then the painted portions as well. So we'll go stair treads, wash, chemically brighten, prep, and one coat stain. And in Minnesota, our normal deck process is up here uh, with any sort of translucent or semi-transparent uh, semi finish. Uh, all the technical data sheets recommend 12 to 18 months, and we don't have the option of doing an 18-month interval. So basically, if you want a cedar-colored deck in Minnesota, you really should be doing a little bit of maintenance every year uh, as you go forward. Almost nobody follows that, but uh, instead of doing two to three coats of stain in one year, we find it much better in the upper Midwest to do one coat of stain every one to three years, give or take, and hopefully the client doesn't go eight or 10 years like most do, so. And then right under that, we will go railing, stair risers, and lattice. Because it had some lattice on the side of the deck there. And we'll do same process. And this time we will do two coats, solid acrylic stain. Whenever we do painted portions on decks here, um, we have lots of moisture. We just had a week of tsunami kind of moisture issues here and we have uh, snow and rain and ice and everything during the winter. So if you just use a, a latex paint on spindles and floors and everything else like that, it bubbles up in six to 12 months. So in the upper Midwest, again, we like a solid color acrylic stain, which gives you the painted look, but the first coat will penetrate in uh, more like a real stain, and the second coat will build a better finish. And the benefit of a solid acrylic stain versus a paint is that a stain is more prone to fade than peel. A paint will peel usually before it fades, and you don't want a peeling deck. I would much rather have a fading deck. So that's what we do for that. Uh, two coats of acrylic stain. attach a price to that. All right. And because she mentioned she wanted uh, uh, a possible uh, pop of color on the front of her house, really with a stoop like that, with, with two colors already and copper caps like that, um, I wouldn't be opposed to putting in a third color, but it gets really busy. So what I'm gonna do is give her an option for the front door too, to give her that little pop of color, because it'll be, less maintenance in the future, less expensive to just paint the front door. And it might actually be a little more formal, sophisticated way of popping color into the house. And I'll introduce that to her uh, when we give her the estimate. So we'll write in entry door, uh, exterior portion only, prep and paint. Okay. All right, so at this point, we have our exterior estimate completely filled out. Uh, I checked my notes to make sure I didn't forget anything. Looks good, so uh, my process then is to download it into a PDF for email use. 
The only thing I don't like about Google Drive is if you try to share just a straight Google document, there has to be sharing permissions, and then some people don't are associated with Google. So if you download it into a PDF, you can see uh, it gives me a preview. <coughs> we will download it. And then we will go back into the folder, drag the PDF into the Google folder. So now we have the manipulatable uh, document, which is a, a Google Sheet, a G Sheet. And then we have the PDF version, which is locked. It's just an image, like a, like a picture. And that's something that's way more uh, easily emailed. So now we will start. That's exterior. We'll go interior. <coughs> okay. So my standard interior estimate, I have everything ready to go for, there's a description of the room on the left, uh, there is a column for walls, ceilings, trim, closet walls, cabinets, and then a total at the end. So when people uh, march me around their house and we start uh, looking at various rooms, I like to do an insanely itemized estimate. So if there's 20 rooms in the house, there's gonna be 20 rooms listed here, and then for every room, there's gonna be one, two, three, four, five uh, particular things that can be estimated uh, per room. And I prefer more detail than not, because uh, if I give people a big matrix of prices, almost like a, a menu, they can basically just highlight what they want, they have all the information, and it, uh, I think it helps them make a better informed decision. And when I do home projects, the least beneficial thing or the least valuable thing to me is when I ask for all random things throughout the house. There's a ceiling in this room, there's a closet in this room, paint my cabinets, do the countertops, things like that. And then an estimate, uh, a contractor will come back and say, it's $1,100 or it's $12,000 and there's one price and not a lot of detail. The problem then is, what if I want to take one thing out? Does he have to refigure? Is his stuff going to be accurate? So I'm a big fan of giving all the information in tiny little bits. You build it apart or you build it together into a big one. You take it apart into a small one and that's a good way to go. That's what I like to do. There's way less jockeying going on later. So, okay, we're going to write kitchen. Uh, we will give a price for the walls. Based on that, we are not going to do the ceiling. We'll leave the ceiling uh, go. The trim is not going to be painted, uh, so we will not uh, we will not include that. There's no closet to do, and the kitchen cabinets. I have a base price based on the number of doors and drawers. That gives me a good idea of based on you know a few hundred of these. This is sort of the going rate for it. Uh, we also have our production rates, uh, and we also have sort of market rate, um, which is you know. Uh, I find myself estimating more and more off market rate because we have our internal production rates, but also there's a lot of factors that go into we're selling our house, we need it done this week, or if there's some urgency to it, uh, the market value might be a little higher or a little lower depending on the particulars of the project. So I give myself uh, a, a whole bunch of different ways. I usually triangulate my prices in three ways. Uh, between what I know we can get done, uh, some sort of production rate so we can have data-driven estimates and then market rate and uh, yeah the, the price per door and drawer gets me there and then I start thinking about is there anything particularly difficult is there a bunch of wine racks is the wood in very tough shape uh, is it uh, oak that's been finished with lacquer in a pour way where the pores are always open that we'll have to do some manual filling is the layout of the kitchen difficult all the little things that that go into it so uh, based on that I will do a quick Calculation. Get rid of this guy. All right, and then I will give them an option, like I mentioned, for the kitchen window. to enamel that and then I will give it a space and I will go for the countertops and in this case instead of the many little items I am going to make one description area so we'll connect all those we'll say clean sand adhesion test and two coats oil 
film, forming, finish. Okay, check my notes here. We've got countertops. She preferred a film forming finish with a gloss, cabinets, possibly two colors, island. We'll add in an option for kitchen island. Sheets adding up right. Okay. Two colors, island, beadboard. We're not doing walls, we're doing 31. And I will also write in an option for a second color. Second color doesn't complicate it all that much, but it is something else, and sometimes we run into a situation where they can't be coated once in a day, so we add in uh, an option for that. Option, second enamel color. Okay. To be determined based on what they want. I just gave them a percentage of the bid that'll be added. So I'm going to clean up the rest of my sheet. It looks like we're good there. I'm going to double check the math of the sheet. It looks good. So basically, uh, on all my uh, estimates before I do this, I'm going to. I don't need the notes anymore. I'll expand this. So the basis of my uh, estimate, there's a couple little notes at the bottom, just sort of the most frequently asked questions. So number one, material and labor included, always. Um, and then the next line says, see attached information sheet for processes, coding info, methods, and color information. And I'm gonna show you guys, I'm gonna walk you through that uh, process sheet the second, uh, it, the second we're done here. It's sort of a half contract, half letter of understanding between me and the client. Um, also, uh, with color consults, uh, I make a note here, color consult does not guarantee a perfect color. Final color choice and samples are the client's responsibility. So we offer people uh, a, a formal color consult. We either tap one of the design pros from Sherwin-Williams, I have a bunch of private designers that I can recommend, or uh, myself or my production manager can actually come back and go through that. We're happy to do whatever they're comfortable with. Uh, otherwise, I'm always happy to talk color, uh, at least my perspective on it, uh, I don't charge for that. And then I also put down here, um, which has become a big part of our business, stain, color, and finish samples or matches are created at X amount of dollars per hour. It's a time and materials basis. Some people don't use it at all. Some people want 10 samples. And it's hard to say a fixed amount what it's going to be. And we kind of leave it up to the clients. Uh, I guide their choices if they want. Otherwise, we charge time and materials, time and materials for that. A uh, big part of, uh, of a lot of this, I make sure I thank all my clients for their trust. So on every estimate, on every invoice, we always state, thank you for your trust. It's a big deal to us. Uh, there's payment terms here. Mine is seven days. And then I make checks payable, obviously, to, to that. Uh, my email address there. Uh, and then a total. And then I also list a, uh, a fee for a color consult. If they want, they can add that in. So I will download this as well. Normally when I'm left to my own devices and I don't have to film this, it takes probably about seven or eight minutes for two estimates like this. Jamming away to music. So now we have our two PDFs in here. And before I print them out, what I always like to do is to email an electronic version uh, of all this stuff to my clients as well. So I'll get into Gmail. Type out estimate in the subject line, and then I always write, attached is your estimate. Let me know if you have any questions. And then the process is always three documents. There's always the estimate. So we go to recent documents here, and it'll show us we have a interior estimate. 
for these clients an exterior estimate and we will add those as attachments then we will go back into Google Drive and I'll attach my marketing material so there's about me and my company and then there's the what to expect sheet which I'll walk you guys through we will attach those as well and when I do cabinets uh, if I think it'll help um, I will attach a few pictures of cabinets that we've done and uh, Kendra mentioned that she was interested in a two-tone cabinet job so I will go down to where I have a two-tone before and after I will also show her a sample cabinet door going from natural wood to that and I will attach a finish sample as well okay we have all of that we will send that on to her so she has electronic copies and then we will start our printing process so this is my sign off sheet this is printed on the back of every one of my estimates and in I always go between having a formal contract uh, I operated for 10 years without anything that anybody signed off on but this thing functions as a sort of letter of understanding plus a contract sometimes a contract and I've seen some contractors contract and they can be 18 pages long and at that point you're sort of scaring clients into what are you trying to protect yourself against so what I basically do is take every question that I get frequently and put it down here in the form of a statement and it's more of a what to expect sheet and before we start a job I actually make my clients read this and sign it and date it so that they know what they're gonna get so the the four basic areas here and I try again simplicity is a hallmark of my company this is a one sheet there's interior walls, there's trim and cabinets, there's staining and varnishing woodwork, and then there's exteriors and decks. And everything that everybody asks, you know, is material and labor included? How many coats do you use? Uh, do you patch walls? All this stuff is in here. The biggest thing that I wanna get over are uh, little barriers to entry from the clients. And to me, it's always contractors, uh, they usually don't give you that many clear deliverables. So I try to make my estimates very clear uh, very uh, easy to understand. I want to make sure people know that we can help them with color. Color is a huge barrier to entry. Uh, we move furniture too, which is a big thing. We basically start to finish, we move all the furniture, move it back. And then a uh, very important thing to us is I state very explicitly in some of the biggest writing on here, we clean. We clean your house after we're done. Contractors are horrible with coming into people's houses, leaving a mess, and even if they do good work. So. Um, I make sure that that's stated clearly. There's all sorts of things about what we do for prep, what we do for actual painting, the application, uh, the cleaning up, things like that. So I'm gonna walk them through. We've probably covered half of this stuff already in there. I'm gonna cover the other half when I go in there. It's a two-pronged approach of being consistent. I go in there and I verbally state what we're gonna do and it exactly matches what's on the sheet back here. And my processes haven't changed in a lot of years and I probably do about 450 to 500 estimates a year and I've been doing this for 12 years so a lot of repetitions and it's very easy to be consistent with that stuff so we will take our USB cable I got my printer already Get a little slack here we already have the printer fired up I got my cream colored thick stock paper already loaded in there and we are going to print a couple copies of this we're gonna have two estimates This will go on the back of every one of my estimates. And uh, I like to have those two together because when somebody says, you know, I got your estimate, but I didn't know that X or I didn't know Y, but it's hard to argue that because it's actually printed on the back of your estimate for your convenience. So, so this is my little Canon uh, mobile printer here. Spitting out the back of the forms here. I built myself a little desk. It's got uh, speaker fabric on top here, so everything's a nice level thing. I got cabinet samples underneath, which I'll drag out and show you guys later. Take those into the house, but this is my nice little mobile platform. The, uh, the couple times previous, I had a stand-up desk in back, and I liked that a great deal, except, you know, today is a perfect example. It's drizzling, would not have been a great day for the stand-up desk. Uh, also, winter stinks with a stand-up desk where I open the sliding door and it's there. But uh, more importantly, uh, I leave these two seats back here because uh, my kids come with me every once in a while and I like to have that avail availability for them. So 
You can see beautiful color. Uh, everything is a standard sort of thing. You can see I wear cream or tan. Our estimates are cream or tan uh, with a little bit of gold and orange writing on there. We're gonna flip these guys over. And we will print out the estimates. We got exterior. Let's do a little preview, we'll print that. So one thing that I talked about three years ago was uh, consistency and branding. And my van isn't logoed yet. This is a newer van. I still have yet to get it logoed uh, in, in the process. But logos on my clothes, logos on the estimates, uh, everything we say and do, the colors all match, the logos match. People feel very much at ease and uh, you can gain their trust a lot better when you're actually uh, presenting a consistent sort of front uh, with all that, not giving them any reason to distrust you. So. Estimate comes off here. Uh, everything looks good. Don't see any smudges. So that was exterior. We'll go to interior. Another huge benefit of Google Drive is um, unlike you know uh, other Microsoft products where you have to save a version, get rid of the old one, replace it, this one you can actually work in real time. So if I had somebody else, a production manager, uh, on this too, you can actually see them working. It'll highlight what they're working on, highlight what I'm working on, and it updates in real time and saves in real time. So you never have to click save, you never have to worry about uh, a bad version of something. Everything's updated in real time. It's all cloud-based and it's uh, it's a breeze to work with. So okay, I have I have all the estimates ready to go here. The other big part is again card and magnet. Uh, love these guys. Uh, it seems a little bit old school to have the magnets, but I love going in houses still after 12 years and seeing my magnets in people's houses. Also, uh, consistent branding messaging. People have probably seen this stuff before, but something interesting as a calling card. Probably not the most useful item for marketing anymore, but people get a kick out of this stuff, and I think it is important. So. All right, I think we have what we need. And we'll tuck the estimates in here to keep them dry and straight. I will also bring out one of my cabinet doors. I have these things padded and nice little sleeves underneath here. Uh, this is one of the best marketing tools you could ever use, especially with cabinets and trim and things like that. We've actually stepped out the finishes between bare wood, stained and varnished, primer and then two top coats of enamel and to make this even more useful I've actually done two colors of enamel um, what we'll probably touch on in there is different forms of off-white I picked the two most used off-whites that I use and and actually have them on one cabinet door we have Benjamin Moore white dove Benjamin Moore Navajo white when, even without my sort of uh, interaction with the client I would say 50% of all my clients who do trim and cabinets uh, white Dove or Navajo White, kind of warm creams neutral. So we're going to take this inside and we're going to present the estimate and then we'll come back out here and we'll go through any questions you guys have. It's a lot of work. It's 
way better to have it fade, especially when it's mm -hmm. white. You know, fading white is not an issue. Right. Healing exactly. white is. So. Yeah. Want to. Two coats of that all over the place, and that'll set you up normally three to five years between any maintenance is needed there. Right. So. Uh, questions about any of the outside stuff? No, that seems straightforward. Right. I'll follow awesome. you. Okay, sounds great. material, labor, uh, we will move all your furniture. Uh, one of the big things that we do differently too is, you know, you can move some of the things on the, on the countertop. If you like, you can maybe take down some art, okay. but otherwise we'll take it from here. Awesome. You, you don't need to move all the stuff. That's also, great. when we're done, we will give everything a thorough cleaning as well. So Thank between you. mopping the floor, dusting, things like that, and we try to just fill in some of those gaps where contractors sometimes don't do a yeah. good job. So yes, thank you for that. That's it's important. a big deal. So basically, all the options on there for you, uh, I give you an option for the cabinets, okay. the window, the mm -hmm. island, um, countertops as well, uh, walls, uh, to do that, uh, walls as well, uh, no trim like we talked about, but yeah. otherwise sort of this, this entire room. Um, awesome. if, if you give us the blessing to do it, uh, we have a very distinct process to set the job up where mm -hmm. we'll go over colors, finishes, schedules, things like that, but when we get on site, First thing we'll do is take this special soft floor protection we have and go from the front door and we'll make ourselves a path all the way into here so that we don't even affect you know, your floors. First thing we do when we get in here is we completely encase the floor so everything else we do is already has a base of, it's just been sealed off. Uh, once that's sealed off, we will take off all the doors and drawers. We'll take off the hardware. Okay. Everything will be labeled. We'll take all the doors and drawers to our shop to finish in a, in a controlled environment. Okay. And then we'll start prepping everything in the kitchen here. Uh, you mind if I open up? No, that's fine. Here? I don't know what you'll find. But. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little bit different one uh, because it's a pull-out. We'll seal off all this internal okay. sort of formica and things like that, the, the laminate, and we'll keep it safe. On a normal uh, kitchen cabinet, what we'll do is there's this three-quarter inch wood lid yeah. right here. We'll completely seal off the white inside with plastic and tape to keep dust okay. and, and odors and stuff out of it. But we will paint that three-quarter inch slip. So when you open it up, you just see you know white or whatever That's color you have. That's so, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these will come off. Um, then we go through you know a process of sealing in everything else. Like we talked about with the appliances, we'll seal them in a way where they're safe, but you can also use them. Sink as well. We we prep the sink off, but then we have a flap that comes over it, so you can okay. just peel the flap back every day. And, Wonderful. And deal with that. Um, Doors and drawers and the boxes together will all go through a process called SVT, which is okay. sand, vac, and tack. Okay. And that's every time we do something to the cabinets, we do this SVT process to remove debris, smooth it out. We sand it all down, we vacuum off all the dust, and then we use tack rags, microfiber, and okay. we get all of it off so it's squeaky clean, no nice. little fiber and okay. stuff. Uh, and then we go heavy oil primer on everything, and that's the only stinky day okay. in the process. So okay. It would be great to convert my entire company to water-based finishes and yeah. stuff, but they're not there yet. Okay. They're, they're still prone to chipping and things like that. So we go heavy oil-based primer on everything. Okay. The negative air machines, the air scrubbers do a big deal. Yeah. We'll be able to smell paint that day, okay. but you can leave that air scrubber on all night if you oh, want nice. to okay. do that. So Perfect. After the primer goes on, SVT again. So we okay. sand all the primer down, we vacuum it off, tack rag it. At that point, we seal off all the cracks. So where the crown molding is here, we'll seal it off towards the ceiling okay. where it meets the walls. If you want us to do the window, we'll seal all the cracks in the window. We'll okay. uh, putty any nail holes that aren't filled okay. and we'll, we'll fill the cracks. That will basically give you the seamless yes. sort of look with all the cabinets. So every time where there's a gap or something like that, you it's just... notice that. Yep, and it's, it's usually not a big deal. It doesn't affect the use of the cabinets, but when, you know, you can imagine if you paint them all white, those black hairline yes. cracks now just show up. In right. An instant. So, yep, especially with old cabinets. Oh, exactly. And mm -hmm. the only thing we do not caulk is the inner panels. Okay. Uh, with those, those, uh, those are called floating panels. And when carpenters or cabinet makers make them, they have to move with seasonal humidity. Okay. And if you seal them in there, sometimes the panels have even cracked. Okay. Or Good to know. 
Yeah, and, and sometimes even if the panels don't crack, it'll pull at the sealant in there and it starts getting rubbery and comes undone. So it's good in that, that case, better to have a hairline crack than right. to have some gummy yes. sort of, yeah. Something weird looking. Exactly. So after we're done with the process in here, usually four days, we'll deep prep everything. Okay. And then uh, all the doors and drawers in the shop still usually need another day of curing okay. before we bring them back. So this will all be cleaned up. Everything will be back to normal. You just won't have doors and drawers. And on day five, we'll come back. And if you want us to do the walls, we'll do the walls and we'll install the doors, nice. install, uh, adjust everything and make sure everything is, is up to snuff. So yeah, that sounds very detailed. Way, yeah. more, way <laughs> more work in the process than I yeah. thought. But well, that's and good. you know, HGTV would have you believe that it's a weekend and a can of paint. And, and right? it's like, you know, we probably put in, you know, 60 or 65 hours. And we have all the tools and all the experience. Right. And it's it's a technically there's nothing more difficult to paint in your house than cabinets. And it's an intimidating job <laughs> to take on yourself too. So the you know the actual act of painting them isn't that bad, but if you make a wrong step, you sort of have to replace them. Right. You know, a, a set of peeling or cabinets like that are not easy right. to fix. You know? Right. So yeah, it's, it's a, an investment if you had to do that. It's a big thing, and for us too, you know, the, the problem is there's there's lots of other ways to do this. And using oil primer and true enamel and professional spray equipment but when somebody calls me there's really like the there's not an excuse you yeah. know it's like it has to it has to be chip free it has to be washable and really you know there's not a more economical way i found than this so um and, and you have experience so you would know <laughs> lots of these things lots that's of these amazing things. So, yeah and on the back of this thing here too um we have the entire process for oh, painting wow. walls okay. uh, between patching, taping, things like that. And then everything we just walked through yeah. is actually listed right here. So That's great. if you have to describe it to your significant other, if you have okay. questions later, this is a lot of information. Yeah, so it is. If you have any questions like this, it's all there for you. Right. Also, I've included all this electronically in an email to you. Oh, so thank you. Okay. You have both estimates, the sign off sheet, and I actually, because you were yes. thinking of two tones of, yeah. um, of paint, I included some pictures of previous cabinets that I actually oh. did in two tone to help you see like the sniff test. Is it right away? Is it good or bad? Right. You know, that's sometimes helpful. So it is helpful to visualize yes. for me anyway. Yeah. Thank you for that. This I will have to articulate all this to my husband. So and I'm happy to explain any of it okay. to you. email, call, text. I can even come back if you okay. guys like. So perfect. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is basically what what we expect. I have a finish stepped out here, not dissimilar than what you have. This one happens to be oak. But you have maple, and, okay. and your finish is going to be way less, Grainy. you know, yeah. Okay. Then, you know, with with the oak, the, the common question is always, do you get rid of the grain? We don't get rid of the grain, but we fill the pores. Yeah. So okay. that when you hold it up, you're not seeing any of the little black holes. You're yeah. not going to get any of that here. That nice. But, uh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. That's great. That's like a nice smooth finish that's wipeable. It's, uh, it is a true enamel. So really, besides things that you can bake on in, in a factory, there's really nothing harder that you can get in a, in a house than these, so yeah. Amazing. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, uh, questions otherwise for me? Um, let's see. No, I think you've laid it all out here. And Thank lots you. of options, so if the project, if you want to do it all, if you don't want to do parts okay. of it, all the data is there, and just you can kind of pick and choose, and whatever your guys' wishes are, just please let me know. I will. Thank you so much yeah. for doing this. Well, uh, these You've are fun really projects. I would, if there's a way I can help, I'd love to. Thank so, you for that. Wonderful. All right, I'll talk to my yeah. husband, and we'll get back to you. Thanks so much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kendra. I can relieve you of duty here, Toots, if you want. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You probably got kids to take care of, too, right? <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, yeah, you got it. All right, so I'm going to plunk this thing down, and I'm going to see if we got any questions, comments, otherwise. Give me a second. I think uh, I think clients got to get out here. So I will move on to the street, and we will take care of questions. So thank you guys for watching. This is uh, 
this is always a fun thing and I'm, I'm actually a little disappointed in myself that it's taken three years to update this thing because Lord knows if anybody's been following Aska Painter, uh, lots happened in three years, personally, professionally, and otherwise. So I'll park and we'll see what questions, comments we got here. All right, go back through and scroll. Sorry for the delay. Normally I like to get on these questions. Uh, Joe, Eddie, Russell, Michelle, Nelson. Oh, Nelson, Luis D'Souza, Bautarde, my friend. Uh, Brandon Nikolai, one of my budding young craftspeople. Jamie Norris, Kurt Hines, Jim Callahan, friend of the show, friend of mine, and, uh, and client as well. Mike McGrath, always love Mike McGrath. Brian Santos, Observing the Master. That's high praise coming from you, Brian Santos. Uh, if, uh, if you guys don't know Brian Santos, uh, look him up. One of the most interesting dudes in our industry. Kristen Lumbrick, Jose, thank you for watching. Rodrigo, Chad Turpin, Heike, thank you for watching. David Michael Olson, friend of mine. Holly, production manager Holly is watching as well. Crystal, Adam Northenskold, fellow Minnesota painter up here. Scotty Frayne, Randy Held, Dustin Zapanzik. Good friend of the show, Dustin Zapanzik from Vancouver. Monty, Paul, Sebastian. Oh, Patrick Santucci. How's it going, man? Scott Walsh, thank you very much. Uh, Deb, Mike Palm. Cousin Mike Palm. Good to see you, man. You're getting married soon. Good luck, man. Gerardo, thanks for watching, man. Joao Ferreira. Oh, man. How's it going, man? Uh, bum Gia, my friend. Uh, all you guys down in Brazil, thanks for all the support. Sam Reuter, Aaron Green, Ty Staler, Chris Shuck. Mike Wojan, fellow Minnesota painter. Matthew Ferris, Sean Comerford, Brian Santos. Do try to close the project right then and there. So the closest thing that I get to closing a project on the spot would be basically what I said, which is I'd love to help you with this or if there's something I can help you with, let me know. Um, I get a lot of recommendations from people to be a little more forceful, be a little more direct, ask for the sale. Um, so far, at least in this stage of my business, I am outpacing my business, uh, my production capabilities, uh, 1.5 to 1 uh, for sales. So it hasn't really been a concern. I do have a fairly uh, strong follow-up policy with this stuff. I follow up frequently and then I stay in contact. Uh, I know it sounds, it might be an excuse uh, and I'm open to that idea, but up in the upper Midwest, we are very passive aggressive. And uh, almost every uh, time we get into an estimate, you know, just like what Kendra said, well, I'd like to talk this over with my husband. I mean, it's a multi, multi thousand dollar job. And to ask for it on the spot, I think, I think a, a rational person would say, it probably is a good sales thing to do to ask for it, but I would not want my spouse or my spouse would not want me entering into a multi, multi thousand dollar contract without at least discussing. And uh, I know that there are people much better at sales than me who do things otherwise with good results. And I'm, I'm open to the fact that I'm on the evolution of becoming a salesperson. And Brian, you're much farther on that evolution than I am. So uh, I'd be curious, uh, especially with Brian, with a guy like you after seeing that, what you would have done different. Is there anything that disgusted you about that thing? Is there anything that you were just like, oh my God, I can't believe he's not doing this. I would love to hear your feedback on that. So, um, Basically, that is my sales process uh, in a nut. Um, I usually like to schedule my estimates, uh, group schedule them in the afternoons. So we'll go from maybe 12 or 1 to maybe 4 or 5. I still like to try to reserve evenings for my family. If somebody absolutely cannot meet Monday through Thursday in the afternoons, I will do an evening estimate, but I really try to do them. Um, I really try to keep my family time sacred and uh, just like Friday afternoons and uh, in two minutes technically I'm on family time here so uh, uh, one thing I should mention too that this is a this is a topic for a completely other time is um, uh, no CM estimates so in looking back over this last year um, a very large portion maybe even half of all my exterior estimates it could be even as much as 65 percent i've never seen the house and i've never seen the people and because the schedule gets so crazy and I, and i know that a lot of people do a lot of price shopping for exterior stuff um i uh people inquire through my website they give me all their information uh, they describe the project and i say you know what here's two options for you uh, in about five days, I can come out and meet you and we can get you an estimate or in two hours, I can give you an estimate if you send me pictures and readily uh, people will send pictures. And this is something that uh, we're probably going to discuss in the gathering of Minnesota painters. 
I know that at the last PCA event, Paint Contractors of a, a Paint Contractors Association, the residential forum, this is a topic of a lot of debate of, you know, if, if you're doing these estimates, you've never met the people, you've never seen the house, how accurate are your estimates and you're not forging that personal connection. And I will say, I have lots of production rates. Uh, I know what my people are capable of and I have uh, 27 years of experience and you really can't throw something on a house that I haven't seen before. If something does raise my eyebrow, if there's something that's not clear or I'm really wondering about prep on the outside of a house, I will go do a site verification. I mean, I'm not that clinical where it's like, I will not go to a house, but I give people the option and I believe that I deal with rational, um, rational uh, consumers. And I give them a choice basically between a velocity and speed of the estimate versus you get me in your house and we talk about it. And honestly, I've seen a big tip in this. Um, five to 10 years ago, I don't know that if somebody called me and asked for an estimate, I said, email me some pictures. First of all, I don't think many people were hip to the uh, technology. Uh, number two, I don't think people quite trusted that sort of thing. And I think Amazon has done us a great service in this regard because you can get on Amazon, you can hit one button, one click, buy now. And sometimes if you're in a metro area, within hours something will show up at your door. There's no credit card fraud, you get what you pay for. Uh, I have not been surprised with Amazon at all. I've not had any fraudulent uh, financial activity. And when I order something, I'm usually never surprised. I think people are getting used to this. I think when uh, people are way more comfortable with saying, listen, I have a choice. I could buy this shirt. I'm gonna have to wait till Sunday. I'm gonna have to drive to a mall. Hopefully somebody has it. Um, hopefully I'll be able to try it on. If they have my color, my size, whatever else, uh, there's a time involved, there's driving, you have to wait. I think people love immediacy, sometimes even more than forging that personal connection. And this is where marketing comes in because if all your marketing is consistent, if all your social media, your website, even referrals from people, if everything is consistent, the logos are the same, the colors are the same, the message is the same, uh, you don't give them any reason to distrust you. I'm easy to find uh, contractors. Uh, we're going through a project right now where we're looking for a lot of contractors to help out with estimates. I am amazed how many contractors don't have a website. You search for them, there might be a Facebook listing that's automatically generated. There maybe is a Yelp, there's this and that, but they are insanely hard to actually find. I am very easy to find. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no doubt with that. So if you give people no reason to not trust you or you help them with the velocity of this, somebody decides they wanna paint their kitchen cabinets on a Friday, they want an answer. And people say, well, they're just price shopping. Yeah, but we price shop. We need to make informed decisions with data and if somebody came in and told me it was $400 to paint my cabinets or it was 10,000, that's needed data that I would want and I would love I would love that data just to know. And I don't wanna waste that contractor's time. And that's where these sort of no see estimates or the, uh, the instant uh, electronic estimate uh, comes into play. They can send me images. I don't have a large time commitment. Every one of these estimates that I go to is somewhere between two and three hours of a commitment. So if I can do a no CM estimate, if I can do a, uh, an electronic estimate for somebody, um, that saves two to three hours of my schedule. And this summer, I probably did 150 of those. So you take that times two to three, that's a big deal. That's weeks and weeks and weeks of your time. And you know what? If your closing ratio stays about the same, you know, uh, industry average is maybe 50%. If you can keep your industry or uh, your closing average uh, about that, you know that you're still hitting kind of market prices and the demands of people. So I honestly think that in our generation and people, uh, I'm, I'm an old millennial, uh, but everybody younger than me, honestly, I think they're gonna value the velocity and the uh, immediacy of an estimate maybe even more so than forging a personal connection. These people are very savvy at looking at social media, at looking at websites and sussing out who's an actual real company, who's genuine, who actually delivers what they say, there's reviews all over the place. And for me, I mean, my God, I have eight to 10 years of social media of basically me describing why I love this so much. So it's not a difficult sell for a lot of these young people to pop on a Facebook or Instagram, see that you love this, that you're passionate about it, and that you, uh, your website is easy to find, you one click and magically you can get an estimate instantly. I mean, it's this is what's going on in the future and uh, we expect it out of people. I don't know why we don't see it and, and help people out with that. So uh, Joe, uh, 
Brian Santos, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it, especially coming from you. You are a substantial dude in this industry, and uh, thank you so much for the kind words. Joe Finch, always, man. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm a little scared that there's not more comments. So either I did a bang-up job, and this was great, and it's an airtight process, or it's so horrible nobody wants to say anything. So uh, I'm going to get on here afterwards, this afternoon, and uh, we can uh, you can discuss any part of this that you guys want. Uh, pick it apart. I would love the feedback. Nobody takes uh, criticism better than I do. And I would love to know what you would change about this or what you would improve uh, going forward, especially dudes like uh, Garrett Martell, Brian Santos, people that have been around and know uh, the sales process better than I do. So that's about it, folks. I'm out of here. Uh, this is family time for me. I'm going to punch out for the week. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and uh, have a good weekend.